Many non who came here asked me questions and record some of the knowledge I've learned from my grandmother philosophy and some of them taped it one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, and took it. They just used me. Sold the book and make profit and money. I don't know how you're going to use it. People think of archivists as curators of the past, but actually we're, we're handmaidens of the future. Taking it all back home. Taking it all back home? What in the hell does that mean? Taking it all back home. Oh, I said, we want it back. Yeah. Yeah. That's my dad, that's my uncle. This is a program about the lives of recordings. It's the people that are missing from these recordings. This is a program about repatriation. Um, but it's up to them whether they should go back or not. The best thing is we did it, we got it back. See how those London lights are shining Through the frost and falling snow this story begins in London. It's the place where I grew up, and today as a folk singer and song collector, this is my home gig. It's where I live, host concerts, and make my living. It was in the sound archives of the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library some 11 years ago, where I first encountered the historic recordings of some of the great narrative ballads of British and Irish song tradition. But it was the stories behind the making of these recordings and other sounds of the world that inspired me to take to the road and go song collecting in the old-fashioned way to meet the carriers of this music and to make new recordings of vanishing culture. I recorded first on wax. Then I embossed on pure aluminum discs, heavily greased. Worldwide, we have 100 plus years of recordings across so many different evolving formats. Then came acetate discs, and finally, thank goodness, tape. Archives have grown up around the world, storing huge collections of sound. It's so wonderful looking at the shelf here, and there's Welsh whistling, the sheepdog <laughs> calls next to Torres Straits. Uh, you know, the world is brought together here. Yeah, it really is, alongside uh, Nepalese and Indian and West African. The first recordists were wealthy individuals from the West who often thought little about the rights and long-term impact on the people they were recording. But in the last couple of decades, things have changed. Giving these sounds back to the people from whence they came has become a major part of the responsibility of those engaged with sound archives. I don't know what kind of people you have where you come from. This is a program about the lives of recordings. If you can record some of these sacred stories, I've learned what you're going to give me. What's your token of respect? This is a program about repatriation. Yes, yeah, um, so do you want to see... The British Library has one of the most expansive and diverse archives of mechanically captured sounds. Some of the earliest recordings ever made live in its basement. Handle with care. Janet Topfarjan mm -hmm. is the British Library's lead curator of world and traditional music and my Great guide through the collection. This is the mould that begins to take hold. They're beautiful objects and, I mean, it's so wonderful to see the names. Lady Masary, one of the great ballads there. Here are the first instances of sound being used to document people and culture. In this case, it's from the English Folk Dance and Song Society. People had never heard themselves before. And, you know, it was a, in some senses, I suppose, a curiosity. Mm. But in other senses, certainly from the scholars who made the recordings, mm. um, the idea, Walter Jesse Fuchs was one of the earliest, who in 1890, as an American folklorist, was working amongst Native Americans. 
um, with the idea of, as he put it, indelibly fixing traditions. And by 1898, there were letters between him and Alfred Court Haddon, who led the first, what we now call the first anthropological expedition to the Torres Strait Islands. And it was Walter Jesse Fuchs and his letters to Haddon who promoted the use of the phonograph. So it was sort of in the idea of the salvage ethnography. You know, things are dying, we need to save these things. But also in the, the excitement of being able to create documents from oral traditions. Back a collection, C-52, running number 1921, speed 155 RPM. And how is the British Library taking it all back home then? We are a large institution. Our collections cover communities from all over the world, over the whole span of recording history. We can't possibly have the knowledge ourselves to go back and interact with all of those communities to the level that we would need to. So we try and work with people who are oftentimes researching areas themselves. So, for example, we working with a researcher in India at the moment who has been researching Bengali traditions in West Bengal and she's accessed recordings that we have here made by the Dutch ethnomusicologist Arnold Barke on wax cylinder. Um, and she found some recordings that he'd made in 1933 in West Bengal of kirtan, which are sort of devotional music, of a particular family in a particular place. And she, during her research, has found these family members. And she's played them, she's told them about the recordings. And so she's put them, or rather the other way around, she's put us directly in touch with them. And just yesterday, we sent off, at their request for the format of CD, we sent off the recordings of their family members. Recorded sound has existed as a possibility for human beings for a tiny little tick of the clock relative to human history. We did not evolve to hear music and think, I wonder what machine is playing that. Aaron Fox is the director of Columbia University's Center for Ethnomusicology. Our cultures and our minds and bodies and brains, in fact, evolved to respond to pattern sounds as happening in our immediate field of experience and as orienting us immediately to other people and the world around us. The archive represents a true departure from that. These days, we tend to equate sound and recording or music and recording as being the same thing. We tend to hear the recording as a transparent document of sound. Sound is fundamentally transduced when it's recorded. And uh, the word schizophonia, which was coined by the Canadian soundscape composer Armory Schaefer in the 70s, that concept names the possibility of splitting sound from its source. Aaron Fox. Over the last decade, he has been responsible for the archive of recordings made by this woman, Laura Bolton. Uh, I've gone into an African tribe, for instance, naturally they hadn't, and uh, not many other people had at that time seen a portable recorder. Oh, boy, does that give me complicated feelings. I've been listening to her voice and reading her words for, what are we on now, about 15 years. They used to, uh, when they had no word for me, they called me a musical anthropologist or an anthropological musicologist. A big part of the problem for me, to be frank, is the actual word ethno in the word ethnomusicology, which is historically a colonialist conception of the discipline. Recordists like Laura Bolton often painted themselves as intrepid explorers, heading out into the wild unknown to collect sounds, heroically battling danger. Well, I mean, uh, if you call a leopard in your tent a foot from your head, <laughs> danger, I suppose. <laughs> I've had plenty. The word ethno means other, and it makes a marked category in relation to musicology. And it allows, it perpetuates the privilege of musicology's claim to universality being sufficiently grounded in an analysis of Western music. 
in that music becomes Western music. Musicology is the study of Western music, and ethnomusicology is the study of other music, or others' musics. So what were the motives behind this great recording enterprise? There was certainly a prevailing idea that these cultures needed protecting. They were at risk of dying out. Today, the recordings housed internationally in places like the British Library are being used in a more current battle to both conserve and restore particular musical traditions. You see, we are in a time when musicians are very difficult to find. And um, we are trying to capture what we find to be on the verge of extinction, so to say. James Isabije is a musician and ethnomusicologist and member of the National Council of Folklorists in Uganda. I have learned from many recordings of Peter Cook. He recorded music from my own motherland, Busoga, and I have been using it to teach some of my classes of music appreciation. This is Biguala music. Biguala describes the sound of these gourd trumpets in combination and the circular dance that goes with it. James Izabije was instrumental in getting it officially listed, or to use United Nations language, inscribed as intangible cultural heritage. There are only a few older masters still alive today with the skills in Biguala making, playing and dancing. So recordings such as these, made by Peter Cook in 1994, become extremely valuable. I usually record out in the open air. But that day there was quite a breeze blowing, which would disturb the microphone, so I had to find shelter out of the wind. British-born Hugh Tracy dedicated his life to documenting the music of Africa. He began in 1921, arriving fresh from England's Devonshire to farm tobacco in what was then southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Nearby there was an old abandoned brick hut. The door and window frames had been pulled out and the floor was covered with a pile of loose bricks and rubble. For the next 50 years and the rest of his life, Supported by fellowships, grants and recording companies, and worried that the music of rural Africa would die in the face of urbanisation, Tracy amassed a vast archive of recordings. So I cleared a space, made one heap of bricks from Wenda to sit on, and another for myself. And sitting opposite each other, we recorded his first eight songs. Masanga by Jean Bosco Moenda. Masanga, in particular, has been heard, analyzed, and published in notation in several songbooks in Africa and elsewhere. At Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa, he founded the International Library of African Music, where the collection now lives. Archives historically have just been sort of bastions for scholars, but archives in the 21st century have a much bigger mission to fulfill. Ethnomusicologist Diane Tran is leading the library's repatriation work. I don't call it a duty, I call it a, an ethical imperative to carry out return of the historic recordings to their communities of origin. You can't expect everyone to be interested in music heritage, of course not. And nobody's saying that they must be, but giving them the opportunity is the issue. There's this question of the Elgin marbles of sound that the recordings were made, were taken. How do you see the British Library as holding these ancient sonic relics? The good thing about sound is that it's very easy to share. Janet Topfarjan, sound curator at the British Library. I think it's true to say that recordings in the past, people didn't necessarily make them with the long view of being able to reconnect people in the future. You know, indeed, they made it with, oftentimes made the recordings with very immediate 
purposes. They were put into archives such as the Vienna Phonogram Archive or the Berlin Phonogram Archive, uh, which were the first in 1899 uh, to emerge. And they were put there really for academic study purposes. It's really in retrospect that we still have them, we being the world, not just the British Library, they still survive and we have the technology and the knowledge to work with them. And again, I think it's because of changing political situations worldwide that these issues of sharing, reconnecting, repatriating, whatever word we choose, are possible. What do we have coming up now? Now we'll hear something of the American Indian music, which is the oldest music in America, of course. Repatriation isn't always about a particular institution deciding to give a recording back. The impetus can come from the people in the community too. Sometimes it happens by accident, but sometimes the recordings somehow find their own way back home. I'd been avoiding that archive in the first few years I was at Columbia because I had such a negative view of it. So I came into it thinking this is an anachronism. How do we fold it up and get rid of it? Aaron Fox of Columbia University. I discovered, in fact, Nanaba Becker's communication with my predecessor in the first week of being in charge of that archive. It was quite by accident that my family and I found out about it. My sister had a CD that said Navajo songs. You know what? We can't just put this away. There's people who care what's in this archive, and one of them is here at Columbia. My cousin picked it up and started reading the liner notes and realized that the, the people who they were talking about who had been recorded singing were our grandfather, his brothers, and their uncle. Navajo filmmaker Nana Barbeka knows what it's like to discover voices thought to be lost and suddenly returned. After finding out about Laura Bolton's archive, which also coincidentally was in the same building as the school I was in, I walked upstairs and knocked on the door and said, you have my grandfather's recordings in here, and um, found out that there were hundreds of songs that they had recorded with her, and they were all housed there for years, and none of us knew about this. But yeah, so when, you should check out Window Rock. That's the, they named the capital after this rock track. Yeah. Oh, there it is, there. I went to visit the Becker family in Arizona, who had gathered together on a Sunday afternoon in Nanabar's sister, Vita's house on the Navajo reservation. Tohachi, Coyote Canyon, Crown Point, Standing Rock, Red Springs, Gallup area, Windrock. The res, as they call it, is the ancestral land restored to the Navajo people, governed as a semi-autonomous nation. His landscape is a wild open desert of deep painted canyons, drive through restaurants, huge sunsets, and weather worn, rust colored rock. Watch Mr. Kitty. On the sofa, with the golf tournament playing on the television, surrounded by three generations of Beckers, we listen to some of the 16 CDs worth of recordings that Columbia University returned to the family. <laughs> These were the recordings made in 1933 at the Chicago World Fair. It's extremely emotional for me to talk about this history and these recordings with my mother because she, I mean, that was her father. and She grew up around these songs and their teachings, but because of the United States trying to sort of get rid of, assimilate Native Americans. That knowledge wasn't passed down. Vicki Becker, Nanabar's elderly mother. Us women, I, we were trying to learn how to weave, and during the daytime, but at night, we sort of like after supper, we'd stay the, and do our spinning, carding, and that was... And would you tell stories and sing songs as well? Oh my goodness. 
those songs, so I can't remember. It is, it go, the song goes along with everything. Right, Biddy? Even grinding gr- gr- your corn. And her father and her grandfather were medicine men, a status role in Navajo society. They were keepers of ceremonial blessing and pray songs and great healers. But song also came with everyday activities like grinding corn, playing games and brushing hair. But I, I could just sing it just a bit. Yeah. Here. This is... See, yes is your, your thinking, right? Oh, goodness gracious. You asked my yes. mother if she knew any songs in regards to brushing hair. And just immediately she started singing and brushing my hair, and that's never occurred before. I forgot all about Biddy. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's what we used to do. The thing is, for especially people of her generation who were really took the brunt of this sort of, like, we're, we're going to kill the Indian to save the man kind of idea is what they said at that moment in history. And so it wasn't like she had forgotten any, anything. It was that she didn't feel that something that she could pass on. And now, many, many, many years later, with the grandkids and everything, it, all that stuff's kind of coming back to her. That's a- that's grounding. Oh, that's grounding. <laughs> See, when I was growing up, I forgot all... (laughs) (laughs) He has left the building. (laughs) The star has left the room. As I listened to Vicky's grandson, Bahi sing, it seemed obvious that these scratchy sound documents have brought a really significant energy in the 10 years since they were brought home. I'm very glad that these recordings exist because I personally was not exposed to them. And for me, it was like a message from the past sent to us and we were meant to find it. You're probably aware of the history of Native education here, that it was forced and imposed upon us. It was much more brutal with my parents' generation. They were actually captured, rounded up, and taken to boarding school. And when a child accidentally spoke Navajo, they had to wear a wooden sign around their neck, and the sign said, I speak Navajo. The first Navajo poet laureate, Lucy Tapahonso. There's a saying, they say, the sacred begins at the tip of my tongue. So whatever you say is a holy thing. But what happens when you don't find out, if you don't discover the archives? I can't in any way tell you why that sound connected with someone walking through the borderlands between Essex and London, uh, how long ago it was, 2008. And I I was using it in DJ sets and I was putting it on dance halls and in in galleries and things and I just fell in love with the sound. I fell in love with the sound, it was as simple as that, I didn't really know what it was. It's just mesmerising. Noel Lobley is a sound curator, DJ and ethnomusicologist. He's worked extensively with the archive of Hugh Tracy recordings housed at the International Library of African Music. It's a stringed instrument that's mouth resonated. It's not plucked or anything like that. It's a a vulture quill used by 
shepherd boys to communicate sometimes with cattle, sometimes with birds. Uh, the piece that I fell for is called Kajaone, which means, I think, Mountain Eagle. It's a Tracy recording. And I honestly think in some way that uh, that affected me enough to ultimately go to South Africa and live there and become deeply involved. The Tracy archive includes songs from the townships, music recorded on the doorstep of the library building itself. I was fully aware as an outside agent that the most important thing was not me, but it was Nyaki Tsana or Oli Lemadinda or their friends. It's the local artists for me that bring the power back to these histories because they live there. The first time I asked Nyaki, why, why don't people come? Why don't, are people interested? Should they be interested? What do you think? And then he sort of said, well, no, and it's the university. It's, it's, it's not, we don't, you know, it's not really for us. The access is only for the academics and the community. Just right at the doorstep, people they don't know. Come to the townships, come and see what we do here. So I said, OK, well, that's great. And that's when I started hanging out in the townships. But you come to the archive as well, and let's, let's think through how we might change the archive. You know, so let's do both. And as I went through the recordings with him, and I didn't know Somaguaza, Nyaki said, this is our anthem. And he said, if you want these things heard, the first thing we'll do is we'll round up my artist friends, we'll hire a donkey cart, we will learn the songs, we will travel around the townships on the back of the cart, playing them on a tape, singing the songs, we'll then set up a PA system on the street and people will come, you just watch. So, we can play these archives or these recordings and dance and rejoice with them and be with those people, even if those people are not there. And he was absolutely right. People just came. People were DJing, and then, and then they suddenly work Tracy's recordings into their performances and, and then ask people whether they recognise them, did they want them, did they know them. And some people, young kids, maybe hadn't heard them, and then elders at the back would tell a story that they came from such and such a village. It was that moment of the street cipher, the street forum, that made it all happen. And for me, that's like, I didn't design that in any way. I just helped make it happen. And, and took a complete back seat. The translation is something like Father of the Stabbing. Tracy claims it as a praise song for the chief after a cattle has been slaughtered. That's what it was documented as. But I can tell you that it promoted some of the most vibrant and rich debate about Hossa culture, who Samaguaza was, nobody agreed. The men said, oh yes, the women are not allowed to hear this song. And the women are like, what are you talking about? We've been singing it for years. It's sung at a particular moment during an Umgidi initiation ceremony for other people. No, it's not sung at that point. So it's clearly, there's no fixed meaning. The knowledge of the archives, the strength that I've got from these archives, I can feel it, I can see the difference. Repatriation here seems to take on a more activist approach, and in the years since that project, the Hosa community are continuing to engage with their songs. As the mastermind of Noel's project, Niaki describes it. The archive is like a baby boy. And now, as a baby, we need that baby boy to grow up, to stand on his own, to be able to walk from where they put him, from where he is, to walk towards the people, to walk through the people. Sampling, in a sense, can be an expression of repatriation too. A current crop of hip-hop artists are working with the Tracy Archive, using the material as the basis for new tracks. Tula Matwana, a lullaby, is heard again in Baksolili, performed by Ayabulela Ngalwane. 
It is a song to children who grow up without fathers. He is saying that they must work hard and make something of their lives and also respect their mothers who raised them. Where do we journey to next? Thinking about repatriation reveals an obsession with recording. This fascination with being able to take sounds around with us, of making them into objects. And it raises many questions about how song collectors like myself today approach the ideas of cultural value and sensitivities that are always present when you turn a microphone on. That expression, means you address Mother Earth and its divine creation. Dr. Wilson Aronilth Jr. is a Navajo teacher at the Diné College in Sealy, Arizona. He said, Neyawa, we are addressing the cosmic natural order. And then you're going to say, Shili Anne, Shika Anne. I hear my horse neighing early dawn. When that morning star comes up, my horse is neighing. We're listening here to a Navajo sacred horse song. Importantly, as it was being recorded, he missed out key words. This song would usually be sung in ceremonial settings over several hours without outsiders like me being there. But as Wilson says, the power of these songs is lost in a recording and means nothing for a non-Navajo who comes at them with curiosity. You don't just take something to be greedy or just for granted. Our people don't learn their knowledge out of curiosity or coincidence. It has to be natural. Only if you're a coyote. <laughs> the coyote was the one that found curiosity and out of coincidence. So I hope you don't have that, because what nationality are you? British. I don't think British have curiosity or out of coincidence. If you do, that means you kind of lie, cheat, you instigate things, you mobilize, control people. We have been guilty of that before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was just curious. I wanted to have a blessing with ceremony. I was just curious. I went to a uh, novel ceremony. It's not going to work for you. Did you run into tribal taboos? Not seriously, and not for long, because I always found a way. Sound recordist Laura Bolton. Even one Indian tribe had very secret ceremonies, which they were even afraid to talk about. But I made friends with the old chief, and he said he'd be killed if it was ever known that he had given them out. And um, I gave my word of honor, and I have never played those for anybody. I think the old man must be dead now, and one of these days they'll probably be released. But he went way out in the desert with me, and we sat under a cactus bush with a battery-run machine, and he gave me the whole cycle of songs. What exactly is a recording, and who owns a recording, and what are these ideas of intellectual copyright, and are they relevant? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> the, the... Noel Lobley. Uh, for me, a recording is, 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 is as simple as uh, an audio document. You know, it's something that's an audio document and that is repeatable. You know, that, that is my understanding of a recording. And it depends, doesn't it? So in technically, the person that's pressed to record quite often owns the recording, but not always. There's also this idea of moral rights, you know, over and above intellectual rights. There are performing rights. And then there's, there's content rights over... A song, it's, I think it's fair to say it's very, very complicated and it's not agreed internationally or cross-culturally either. How does a community claim ownership over a sound, right? And what happens when a sound is split from its source and then starts circulating in the ether, <laughs> as it were? Christina Jacobson is a cultural anthropologist and ethnomusicologist. There isn't even a framework to understand communal ownership, right, or communal intellectual property. And so then retroactively, how does a community reclaim 
access to and ownership of communal knowledge that's already been leaked out when when the only sort of legal framework we have to understand it is based on individuals, right? And their right to sort of share or circulate a story. Laura Bolton sold her recordings to Columbia University in 1961. And for Aaron Fox, now in charge of the collection, repatriation must address the recording's legal status. How you decide who has what rights in a pre-1972 unpublished sound recording turns out to have nothing to do with federal copyright law. However, that's the body of law that's asserted as protecting Bolton's rights and the university's rights and the other institution's rights. It's basically a lie, <laughs> which is a terrifying and saddening thing for me to learn over the course of a few, you know the last few years because I had really hoped we could clarify legitimate ownership of rights for the reason that I wanted to be able to give them back, dissolve them, you know, transfer them. Basically, if you own something, then you can give it away. We don't own it, which means, unfortunately, the continuing hegemony of Western intellectual property law says we can't give it back. The collection is called, here at Columbia, the Laura Bolton Collection of Traditional and Liturgical Music. I have covered the globe, and the uh, more than 20 expeditions in the last 30 years have taken me literally to all parts of the world, so that it's quite safe to say that this is the largest private collection in existence of the music of all the world. It's not, and it wasn't then. And uh, the idea that it's a single collection fixed with her name That actually is the alchemy that she performs in making the sale and that Columbia participates in by purchasing the collection. There it is. That's the moment. That's the framing that created the second level of alienation of these materials from their points of origin and their communities of origin. And in that moment of conversion, the Native people disappear fully. From 1961, when the conversation between Bolton and Columbia begins, until 19... 90, when the intercorporate agreement between the Library of Congress, Indiana, and Columbia is finalized and the Bolton Foundation is dissolved, not one mention occurs in thousands of pages of documents of the interests, the rights, or the stakes of the people on the recordings, not just the indigenous people, all of them. They do not exist. There is definitely a perception that to record means eventually to make money or somebody will make money from this that that's tr- you know those coming back up against Tracy's um, mission his endeavors were that you know it to, to record might eventually bring material benefit and I think there's reason to believe that you know Tracy did work alongside Gallo records and, and some artists did make a lot of money out of Gallo records not many but some so I think it's reasonable to have that assumption You feel that if if you aren't, then someone else is making money out of that. My noticing that young Sangha African opened up for him an entirely new life. At that time, he was one of the messengers working for the passport office in Jadaville. But as soon as I'd published his songs, everything began to happen to him. He was taken up by a local gramophone company, sent up to East Africa for a while. His songs have even taken him to America and the Newport Folk Festival. But for me, I think I shall always think of him as that young man with a wire string guitar sitting there on the edge of the pavement and unknowingly waiting for me and my recording machine to turn up. Good luck to you, Mwenda Jean Bosco, wherever you may be. From one perspective, the repatriation business challenges a modern-day fascination with the past, but also an obsession with the highly subjective view of authenticity. Christina Jacobson's research and writing focuses on a more current interface between language, identity and creativity, that of Navajo country bands. My constant question is, like, why do we expect that Native peoples, you know, why are they only allowed to perform traditional songs in order to be considered Native? That drives me crazy. And I feel like historically that's been a sort of obsession that ethnomusicologists have had with purity and with ideas of cultural continuity and tradition so that there isn't any sort of conceptual space for us to understand that, quote unquote, authentic expressions of contemporary Navajo identity are exactly that. They're engaging with contemporary modernity 
in the ways that everyone else does. You know, I'm Scandinavian American and in no way am I expected to travel to UNM to teach in a Viking ship, right? Like that, that expectation is not put on me, but it's absolutely put on native peoples and I'm not expected <laughs> to speak Danish or Norwegian, although I do, yeah. Hot eh? Dennis Yazi and the Night Breeze Band, Navajo country music from Thoreau, New Mexico. Even the model of repatriation has problematically at its core some idea that we're even empowered to return things. And in some ways it's narcissistic and self-centered because we proceed further into irrelevance if we don't do this. So it's in our interest if we continue to exist as a field at all. As a term, repatriation has been debated by those who are using it the ethnomusicologists and the archivists. What does it mean? Certainly giving back CDs is not the full story. It's one part of the music's journey back to life. If we can change anything out of a thing like, you know, repatriating music archives about the bigger picture, we're not going to recover land for people. We're not going to get back ancestors who were murdered. But we can start to chip away at the persistent primitivizing and othering tropes which are not necessary for respecting people's cultural difference. Repatriation is part of an initiation of a cycle of reciprocity, the main goal of which is to put many, many more strong native voices and indigenous voices and formerly colonized voices at the table in the academy, discussing how we discuss them and uh, we and them starting to blur. So now I'm now in a more reserved, if not cynical, not pessimistic, but more reserved view of the reach of the archival work itself. And that doesn't exempt us from the next step. And the next step is to think big picture, how did we make this mistake? How did we get in this situation? And what are we still doing that is the result of the accumulated power and privilege of that history? The sacred begins at the tip of my tongue. I say goodbye to Window Rock as I stand under the eye of this incredible sandstone arch. And I say farewell to all the families and all the wonderful storytellers that I've met and to this living archive. Um, I guess I leave with a, a question and a deep understanding of what home is and how the recordings are so part of the, the history, but they're part of that patchwork of repatriation and that continuation The recordings are there just to remind of how it once was, but actually the chain of knowledge is very unbroken and thriving. Why would you record it when you can remember it? In German, the word for a recording is a tonträger, a sound carrier. We tend to go with the view that you switch the recorder on and you let it run. To sing is also connected with a journey, to go forth like to move forward. A society which does not know that this is where we came from can go anywhere. Go where exactly is not revealed, perhaps to the local dancing place. In the morning, you leave your home to go somewhere, and when you are done with what you are doing, you come back home. Taking it all back home. Taking it all back home. We're ending with the roots of words, and the verb to record comes from the Latin, to pass through the heart again. We're right behind you. I don't care where you go, you're gonna be fine.